today's open forum on open textbooks. <laughs> well, I'm glad to know that. Um, hosted by the CSU Libraries with the support of the Faculty Committee on Libraries. I'm Meg Bronzica. I'm the Assistant Dean for Scholarly Communication and Collection Development at the CSU Libraries. I'm so pleased to welcome our nationally recognized speakers, Dr. David Ernst and Sarah Faye Cohen of the Open Textbook ne Network, an alliance of higher education institutions committed to improving access, affordability, and academic success through the use of open textbooks. Dr. David Ernst is a graduate faculty and the Chief Information Officer in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. Dave is the Director of the Center for Open Education and the Executive Director of the Open Textbook Network. He is also the founder of the Open Textbook Library, the first searchable online catalog of open textbooks. Sarah Faye Cohen is the Managing Director of the Open Textbook Network formerly the Associate University Librarian at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Sarah joined the Open Textbook Network to foster library's strategic role in advancing access, discovery, and engagement with open textbooks. Thank you so much for joining us today. For the opportunity to learn from Sarah and David, there will be time for questions following, and we look forward to our discussion. And just to let everyone know, we are videotaping today so that other people can watch this later on if they couldn't come today. Um, and with that, please join me in giving David and Sarah a huge welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. This is a busy time of year, and thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to, to, to spend a little time here with us today. Um, I'm gonna, Sarah is going to be taking uh, some other presentations today. I'm, I'm taking this one. So, uh, but we'll field questions at the end, or actually, if you have questions at any time, feel free to interrupt us. We can make this rather informal. Um, happy to, to do that. So yeah, but I'm, I'm, so I'm David Ernst. I'm graduate faculty and um, the chief information officer at yeah, the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota, among a lot of other titles that uh, academics tend to have. Um, but I, I wanted to make you know let you know that my background my background is in education, and that's what this is really all about here today. It's about education, it's not even really about textbooks to be honest. I mean, textbooks are textbooks; they're a real thing, they're useful. Um, but what we're really here to talk about today is actually more about higher education and what we believe about higher education. Now this is old. This is from the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and um, and you know when I when I first saw this somewhere, uh, I I know that I saw that, and in my um, U.S. centric way, I thought, oh, those poor this is the UN document, right? Those poor people in other countries who don't have equal access to education. But I learned through this project that we've been working on now for several years. Ah. There we go. Uh, through this project we've been working on that um, it, it's true here as well that, that not all students have equal access to higher education. This is a study done um, a few years ago showing that in the kind of the first decade of this century that there were 2.4 million students who, did, who were college qualified students. In other words, they took all the right things in high school. They did well enough to go to college um, but because of cost, they didn't they didn't finish college. Now this doesn't include there are a lot of students who didn't finish college, but these are the ones attributed to cost. This is a this is a study done for the Department of Education. Only because of cost is the main reason. That is a lot of people and a lot of impact on cost. That is the kind of the basis of my argument that there really that access to higher education isn't necessarily equal. To ever, for everyone here. So that's really what we're here to talk about today is education and how the students in our classes can have best academic experience. So let's talk a little bit about financial, some financial, the financial situation for students. And here's my main point, I'll tell you right up front. It's different than it's ever been before. The affordability of higher education is way different than it ever has been before. I don't care when you went to school, it's different now. And I want to try to at least prove that to you. So 
Here's data um, from uh, state higher education executive officers who that are they're basically showing you the two main sources of public that public institutions have for funding: tuition, government support, state support. The red line is tuition. The green line is state support. Now this is nationally. This is the data nationally showing that when I was an undergrad way back here. I had a look at the look at the fraction of the cost that was on the burden that was on me, and now look at it today. It's much closer to 50-50. This is national data. Okay? Here is Colorado's data. Red line again is tuition. The green line is state funding. So a bigger burden obviously on the students as far as the uh, how much they're spending. Here's some Minnesota data, University of Minnesota. Um, I, I crunched some numbers to get, this, this shows the number of hours at a minimum wage job that a student would need to work to afford one year, one year of tuition, tuition only, now books, not, not room and board, not, you know, just tuition, at the University of Minnesota, if they worked at minimum wage. Go back from the 60s to the 80s, you're talking two to 400 hours. If you do that math, that's a pretty good summer job. That's a full-time summer job. So some of you, if you went to college back then, that maybe is how you put yourself through college, at least partially. But you could get a pretty good chunk of it done by working in the summer. But here we are today, and if you do the math again, 52 weeks, of 40 hours a week work, we're talking 2,080 hours. We're getting pretty close to that. Full-time job, year-round. Now, we don't even want our students to be doing that, right? We want them to be full-time students, but this is the situation they're in right now. So, um, so basically, if this is the situation, that it's tough for students and they have to be able to afford this, they, they have a few options, right? They can work. This is the work situation. They can borrow the money. And you just have to open the newspaper um, any day of the week. You'll find stories about the, the tremendous burden and the problem of student debt. And you see, you're seeing some of the presidential candidates and some of their policy ideas coming out now about trying to lessen the burden on students. It's because it's really um, gotten huge. Here is the red line here is student debt. The green line is credit card debt nationally. So you can see when the market crashed here in 2008, 2009, people stopped or at least slowed down their borrowing on credit cards. Um, didn't impact student borrowing at all. It's continued to increase. And actually, if you look at the data, this is 2006. It's only nine years ago. And the borrowing was at $500 billion. We're now, nine years later, we're at $1.3 trillion in just nine years. So, all right, that's, that's the big picture financially of higher education. And you may be very aware of that, you know, working here. But there's not a lot we can do about it, is there? I mean, does anyone in the room have control of tuition and fees here? I'm guessing not. Uh, room and board is what the market is around the university um, and so on. But the one thing that we as, as faculty can control are the books and supplies. Now, it is not even close to the biggest cost, is it? I mean, books and supplies, not even close. But it actually ends up being a really important one, despite, I mean, it, it is still a lot of money, but it does end up being an important cost, a little different, and I'll explain why that is. So. Here's the increase in textbook costs um, since it's gone up over three times the rate of inflation. Uh, that green line there is inflation. Uh, this is a, something I just pulled. It's about a month old. Um, there's a study at the University of Michigan showing, and this was amazing to me. They said that, this researcher said that textbook prices have risen faster than any consumer product, any other consumer product, over 1,000% since the late 70s. Anyway, that kind of surprised me. I think there's, there has to be something that's gone faster than, than that. Faster than tuition? Apparently. Apparently. I, I always thought that actually tuition went up faster than, but anyway. 
That was what the researcher said. But anyway, it is still about a thousand percent. And inflation, uh, I think, is in about three hundred percent since 1977. So it's still it's about three times the rate of inflation. Um, Nationally, the College Board says that students can expect to pay twelve, thirteen hundred dollars or so in books and supplies. And that's how they categorize it. That's how they collect the data from institutions. The vast majority of that cost is textbook cost. In Colorado State, you are every institution is required to give an estimated cost of attendance so that students know what to expect coming here and it has to be publicly available on the web. So you can go look it up yourself, it's online, and, and Colorado State then uh, estimates $1,140 for a student, which is right, you know, right on, on target here with what the Nash nationally does. <coughs> and that's generally at the U of at the, uh, Minnesota, I think they estimate a thousand, a nice round thousand um, dollars. At schools that are more technical, it's more about $1,800 to getting close to $2,000, whereas it's the hard sciences where those textbooks tend to cost a lot more. But that's where we're at. Um, so that's kind of, that's the financial piece of it. You can see it kind of an amount of money that, that students are asked to spend. What I thought I'd do, I thought it would be important since I'm not a student, um, would be to get some voice of the student in here today. And so I have a few videos that I want to really, I want to just, um, I want to play to, and all we do is set up a camera up on campus at Minnesota and ask the question, what do you think? What do you think of the cost of textbooks? And here's what we heard. I think they're really valuable, but the cost is just a little, a little too much for students who are always already paying a lot for tuition. Find a way to make costs more manageable because tuition is going up, everything's going up, cost of living's going up, and then textbooks are going up. There is definitely a value to them, but maybe not for the cost that we pay for them. I mean, I guess professors are trying to uh, provide students with books that are reasonable, but I mean, there are some textbooks that are just um, they're just way too pricey. I just feel like they're really overpriced. Yeah. I get frustrated when a, uh, you have to buy a book that's expensive that you don't use. Textbooks are only used for so long before you're done with them. So it's like, you know, you use it for a couple months and then probably never touch it again. If people weren't just um, issuing new editions and just increasing prices, rather stick to what you have. It is kind of expensive. And sometimes I feel like I have to buy the textbook because um, it is required. But it does kind of suck to like throw away so much money on something that you only use for a semester. They, they should keep the same textbook for several years because the material doesn't change that much. I have purchased them and I don't use them, which is kind of frustrating. I think it's outrageous, actually. Um, yeah, they cost way too much in general, I think. So uh, you heard a lot of things there, right? A lot of little, uh, and if you're a faculty member, you've probably heard that before. Some of the things at least, not just even necessarily about your own courses, but just generally just the life of students. If you think about what the things all the things they said, none of them said, well, first of all, I'll tell you, no one interviewed said they don't cost enough. Uh, and no one actually even said that they're fairly priced. Everyone gave us, those were the responses we got. Um, but anyway, I wanted to point out, nobody said that textbooks are bad. They, if you hear, you hear what they're saying, they're saying, I get it, there's value there. You know, yeah, I want to use it, but, but it's just like too expensive, it's worth it. And then they bring out all these kind of detailed problems that come up because of the cost. So my point I want to make is that all those complaints that you heard there were all cost related. Every single one of them. They threw out cost. They wouldn't care if the professor didn't use the whole book. They threw out cost. They wouldn't care if the if he had to buy an old edition. I mean, it wouldn't even be an issue anymore. But so so it cost is the tension there, right? I should point out I I have three sons. My wife and I. They're all in college right now. All of them. So if we can fix this right now, I would really <laughs> appreciate it. But I do want to say that one of them, he was a freshman last year, and we went up to, he was at the University of Minnesota Duluth. He's up on Lake Superior, Minnesota, and, and uh, he's from Duluth. Uh, I was under, undergrad school. 
Oh, really? I said, I, I love that campus. It's a beautiful place. They brought all the parents into one room to do like the parent orientation. And we sat there, and basically it was an auditorium, and there was a panel of students down on the stage, and you could ask them any question you wanted. You know, like, what's it like to live in the dorms? Oh, and they'd, they'd give exactly the responses you, you would expect. And generally, they're pretty positive. Generally, well, you know, they're small, and they do, and, and then how's the food? Well, you know, I mean, it's, you know, uh, but you know what, you can eat as much as you want, and da 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 da. And, and generally, it was that kind of as you would expect. And then somebody asked the question, like, how, something about, it was like, where do you buy your textbooks? And they started talking about textbooks. And I was sitting listening, and my wife, like, nudged me. And she said, did you notice the tone in the room just suddenly went dark? And it did. I kind of thought about it and looked around. And there were parents who were, like, seething. I mean, they were angry because there were students saying, well, you know, I, you know, I sell the book back. I only get this much. Or I... Uh, you know, this faculty member signed a book that they wrote, and, da, 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 and it, it almost has this kind of feeling of um, almost, almost like this betrayal of public trust in a way that there's something like that we're out to get them through these textbook costs somehow, which is not true in any way. So uh, it, it is this kind of, it's all cost related, it's all around cost. And so here's where I'm talking, wanted to mention that I said earlier that textbook costs may not be the biggest, and they're definitely not the biggest, but they're special, and that students have control of them. They don't have control of tuition. They don't have control of their necessary, I mean, you know, their room and board. They have to live somewhere, and so on. They have control of their own kind of spending, but this is something that if they are forced to make a choice, this is a place that could give. And so they have specific kind of strategies that to afford school, sometimes they are forced to do. These are three of them. These are the three that we keep hearing from students. Purchase an older edition, delay purchasing it, or just don't purchase it at all. There is one more that I haven't put on here yet, and I think I need to because it's becoming increasingly frequent, frequently used. Anybody have any other strategies? The what? Are you a foreign edition is one, that's right. Uh, um, there's a long story there, but if they're published overseas, generally they can be cheaper. If, and, and there are people shipping them back to the US to sell the same books for cheap, or, but anyway. An online edition, like electronic versions of it, um, yes, and I mean, the bookstores do everything they possibly can to try to make, they're in the front lines of affordability, and, and they sometimes come off as the bad guy. But they are on the front lines, actually. They offer all sorts of like rentals. I don't know what your bookstore is here. If it's a internal, is it an internal bookstore? Yeah. yeah. You know, they'll offer rentals or, or um, electronic versions of the textbooks that the publishers have available, or rentals. Is that one right? And and so there's all sorts of strategies that way. But there's one that students specifically do. That. Oh, well, there are two. And there's also a collaboration. Sometimes my friends and I, we're in the same class, we'll buy one textbook to share between each other. Good one. That's share a textbook, yeah. And the other one, and I know a lot of students actually engage in this, piracy. Yeah, there's the one. That's what I, that, those are, there's two more I need to add here. Because we'll hear a little bit later from a student who talks about sharing them and the impact of that. But you can go and Google any textbook, and you can download it. Like within two or three clicks, you will find an electronic pirated version of it. And that's becoming more and more popular. And it's hard to get good data about how often that's happening. But I know that the National Association of Bookstores did put out a number a couple of years ago, and it was like 20 some percent. And that's a couple of years ago. And it was increased, had been increasing. Was there a question? We just couldn't hear his oh, answer. Oh, gotcha. And you got it? We do. Okay. So, so I want to go through these quickly because, and what we've learned from them. So, buying an older edition. Um, this is, this is the response I got <laughs> from a student at Minnesota who was asked to buy $80, and it was $80 French textbook, and he found one that was two editions older, and I think he said it was $8. So, perfectly reasonable rationale, isn't it? I mean, he's probably right. The French has intention, but however, you also know that what he's doing, and he knew it, is putting himself at a little bit of academic risk. Right, because if, it's, if you assign readings and it's page this, page that, or the problems are different, or 
there's a little bit of a risk there, and it's going to take him a lot more effort to kind of make sure he's doing the right thing. So, so there's that, right? Delaying purchasing a textbook. So financial aid generally doesn't come in until about three weeks, you know, after the drop date, right? Because because funders don't want to fund a student until they know they're actually in a class. So we're going to make sure that they're actually in it and I've dropped it. The same is true for funding uh, resources like the GI Bill. There's paperwork and process involved, and they want to make sure you're actually in the class. So there are students who have told us time and time again, students have told us that they may go a few weeks in the semester without the book because they need to wait for their financial aid check. At some institutions, there are ways around that, that the bookstore will actually kind of lend the money if they know they have financial aid and they know they'll be able to tap into it and you know, they'll let them buy the book earlier, things like that, but yeah. The other is that we wait until the professors say, actually, yes, we do need this. Right. Uh, what he said was that sometimes we wait as, as students just to make sure that it's actually needed, right? Because if there's this tension of affordability, you don't want to buy anything that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. I know my sons have told me that. And I said, hey, did you buy your book yet? I'm going to wait. And I think that's actually become the rule, not the exception in a lot of ways. So students wait as long as they feel like they can. So quick little voice of the student again. Here's the question that we ask them. Have you ever delayed purchasing a textbook because of cost? I usually wait until uh, I feel like there's a need in the class to buy the textbook, or if I'm falling behind and I can't find another resource for free online that um, would also give me that information. And then I'll buy a textbook. But I have delayed purchasing a textbook until it was completely necessary to have it. Yes, I have, unfortunately. <laughs> I had some troubles because of it. Textbooks are obviously something that you really obviously need. And in order to do well in a class, you know, you need to have that textbook. And because it costs so much, I think a lot of people have problems getting the required text. And therefore, they have struggled in classes they shouldn't necessarily struggle in. So I'm guessing most faculty have seen this from their own. Book for a while, or perhaps they don't have the book at all. They don't ever buy it. And this is a, I've seen this in three different surveys that between 60 and 70 percent of students say that at some point during their academic career, you know, in four years as an undergrad, um, that they did not buy a required textbook, one that was required because of the cost. So all of these are things that students are. It's a situation that students are in that have this impact. So those strategies kind of are one thing, but all of them have academic promise with some academic risk. You don't buy the book or you delay buying the book, and this is what's happening, right? So this is a survey from about 20,000 students in Florida asked, asked about uh, how it's impacted their academic career. And I would say if you if you don't remember anything else for today, we don't have to remember any specific numbers, but if you're going just, this is unacceptable. There's no institution that should be okay with this, really. We want our students to succeed. Besides the individual students, think about it as an institution. How many institutions have four-year graduation goals? Those kinds of things. Well, if you're a course, I mean, look at that. I mean, how many of these are impacting that? of effort that we are trying to help students with. So, and if there's one other thing I hope you remember, it's it's this last little video that I have. It's about three minutes long of, of uh, a student talking about this. So the other questions that I asked were all just kind of like, hey, did you do this? What do you think of this? This we actually, I asked this student questions about the impact. Like, how did the cost, tell me your story. Tell me your story about, about affordability and how textbooks impact. As a student at Carlson. Uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre-major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information system. I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking around and really asking people who have taken the courses uh, because I simply couldn't afford it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative loans from my brothers, uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of um, the tuition. And um, 
So I, I have two of the required textbooks. I'm sharing a third textbook between <laughs> two of my roommates and a guy down the hall. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, and the other two, I just, I don't really worry about because I mean, I don't have enough money for that right now, to be honest. But it, it becomes bothersome when you have to travel, you know, to another dorm just to read your own textbook. Um, but I'd say for, I mean, there's some times where they're like, I, I need the book right now. I can't, I can't give it to you. And so I just kind of have to um, twiddle my thumbs until late at night when they're done. And then I can read the book and then usually I get shorted on sleep or something. I think sometimes I've had to stay up as late as 3, 4, or 5 a.m. and then go to sleep, get three hours, get up and go to class because, I mean, that's when the textbook was available to me. A lot of the times it was just you got shorted on sleep or you, you didn't have enough time to study as you want because I had to pass the textbook off to someone else that needed it. It's just kind of challenging because it's like, you know, it's you, you, you kind of, you're struggling to get enough money and it's always kind of the back of your mind to worry uh, throughout your day that do I have enough money to pay for my textbooks or pay my brothers back kind of thing. So it's it's difficult. I might actually end up having to schedule my courses around what my roommates and people that I know are taking, because if they have a shared textbook, then uh, I might have to take that class kind of thing, because it's if it's something that maybe doesn't interest me, but it fil fulfills a requirement or elective, I might have to take that, because that's 200 less dollars in textbooks. Um, I'm still kind of shocked because I, I'm completely broke from buying textbooks last year. So I have to take out a loan and kind of manage which ones I'm going to buy. And it's just kind of, it always, it always the second tuition, I call it, always kind of uh, surprises me. I mean, just this past year, I'd, I've probably spent in the ballpark of $1,000 and I haven't even bought all of the required texts that they told me to buy. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been difficult. I actually have like the stories of five different students. This is the first one I've cut together. I think there's only a couple of people who've seen this, but um, that to me, I mean, speaks volumes to that story. I mean, even if there are only a handful of those students that are struggling that much, we're doing something about it. Um, I've been told I can be kind of depressing. Um, no, it's it's what I want to do is lay out the issues, but I, I we'll stop with that right now and it's, let's start talking about some possible solutions and, and what we can do um, because we can do some things. And if you think about the ideal, if you think about that graph, like this thing right here, what would solve this problem? What would wipe it all out? They all be zero. Open source textbooks. Open source, and what would, why would that be a solution? Because it's open source means free. Okay, so free, right? If free textbooks Business would, um, would solve it. So the problem with free is that how do you end up with these computers? Textbooks cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to make. Hundreds of thousands, if not a million dollars to make, some of them, believe it or not. And years of somebody's hard, hard work. So how could we possibly end up with free textbooks? Who would buy a free textbook? Did you? Yeah, the ones uh, the ones So he was a textbook author and had the rights to it, one of the older versions of his textbook, right? Yeah. And he put it in the repository for students to access. So that's a definitely a possibility. And I have been approached by a lot of faculty actually who say that. They said, I wrote a textbook. I'm appalled at how much the publisher is charging for it. I was thinking it was going to be 50 bucks, and now it's $250 a semester. That, that kind of thing. And 
you know, what can I do, which there's really not much they can do until the book is out of print, which generally means no one buys it anymore, right? Then, then publisher generally will give the rights back, and then they can do whatever they want with it. Um, so that is one pathway, but not the easiest probably, I mean, and probably doesn't happen very often. The challenge is this, right? I mean, let me just lay out what the challenge is. This is the publishing process as we know it. Publisher invests hundreds of thousands of dollars in a textbook to create it, and they sell it. And when they sell it, they get the sales money back, they recoup their investment, they make their profit, they're able to pay their royalties to their author. Generally around 12% or so is what an author will make. And that's, this is the model we know and love, right, that we're used to. So the question that I, is so common is like, if this doesn't exist anymore, if there aren't any, if there's no money changing hands here, no sales, then why would someone make a book to begin? Like, how could this possibly work? How's the author get paid? How's so, so here are some other models. First one is extremely simple, may have its own complications, but here we go. Somebody just writes one, puts it out in the world. They write it for their own purposes. They write it for their own course. Maybe it's an out of print version of something that was published, but they just say, here world, I don't care. Go ahead, you use it, do what you want with it. That happens. There are a lot of textbooks out there like that. Now, some would criticize this as well. It was maybe not, we don't know if it was peer reviewed. We don't really know the quality of it. Okay, I can take that, but they're out there. But here's another model, and, and, and this isn't the model that moving forward seems to be the model. This is the model. You notice something new in this one? The funder. Now, the, what this means is that the publisher can get its funding up front instead of through sales. Now, this is, um, of course, we could solve any world problem if we just had a funder doing it. We can solve world hunger if we have a funder. The difference here is that we do. We have funders. We have, this is a real thing and it's been going on for years. We have organizations that have been willing to invest in the creation of textbooks with one stipulation. They be free forever. Like we'll pay for this creation, but it has to be free. Right? That means that the author can still get paid. There's money there. It just means there aren't any sales. Right? The textbook's just out there for students to use. The funders are people like this, or organizations like this. There are universities doing this, more and more universities. Oftentimes, it's coming out of the libraries, where the, the university will actually say, put out a call for proposals from its own faculty and say, you know what, we're willing to create a few books. Usually, it's just a couple, right? Because they are expensive to make. And they'll say, you know what, we'll pay you a stipend, and maybe even end up something that benefits you and your service part of your portfolio for tenure, whatever. That's something that um, is happening more and more. I listed a few here, but it's, it's I know Minnesota just started one, um, and so, so that's becoming more and more common. The Hewlett Foundation has sunk millions of dollars into funding open text, textbooks um, creation. And uh, because of that, uh, investment, they have actually, they're, they're in the creation of dozens of new textbooks. Do you have a? Are they looking at, instead of universities funding an external publisher, are they looking at a model of like reinventing or restarting up the university presses? Um, no, I haven't heard that much. I know that at Purdue, there was a very close relationship the, actually, the person, the library person in charge of uh, publishing in the libraries was also the director of the university press. And so he got in, I know that in their program, they kind of leveraged that. I'm not hearing a lot of other presses getting into this, which is unfortunate. I mean, I don't know what the issues are. I'm sure there are some funding issues, but they do have the expertise, don't they? Yeah. So maybe that is an opportunity for sure. The state of California passed a law, uh, passed funding, uh, uh, legislative funding for the creation of 50 open textbooks about two years or so ago. And they've been in the process of putting together the, I mean, the state's not going to decide what to make or how to make it, or they are just funding it. So there are the state systems, the private 
whatever, on putting committees together. It's been taking two years to kind of get that work done, but they did that. Um, British Columbia, now to be outdone, said, well, we're going to create 60. 50 will do 60. So they have been hard at work at that. A lot of what they've been doing is creating Canadian versions of, of some of these books. Do we have one book from either of those places yet? These Columbia, British Columbia has. Yeah. Yes, they have. They've been. They have some funding to do some work on. I, I don't. Um, uh, they're basically their goal is to get um, more employees in certain jobs, and so they've been focusing on training for those. And the work they, they had a lot of, of British Columbia has been on that, and on taking some existing open textbooks and moving them into Canadian versions. So the examples may be more Canadian centric. I can't give you an example of that, but they've been doing a nice job of it. Professional organizations. This is actually, I, I guess I probably shouldn't call it a professional organization. It's a consortium of schools. Cali is the computer aided, computer assisted, computer assisted learning, legal instruction. Legal instruction. Thank you very much. Um, and so it is a consortium of the way they describe it, just about every law school in the US. I don't know which ones aren't, but so most of them are. And it's centered at Cornell. And they publish as a consortium of schools through consortial funding. They publish, uh, I think there are between 25 and 30 law textbooks um, that then they can all use. And they're openly licensed. So any law professor in the world then can access them and use them. But they are making that decision as a consortium of what they need and putting the content in there, hiring their own faculty to do it, right? Consortial faculty. So, so this exists. This isn't like some dream, like, you know, boy, if we only had a funder. This is happening and it's happening more and more. You're seeing that interest as the pressure on students builds. But there's one piece of this that's missing. And and this is actually where you know the open textbooks or that term comes from. This piece that's missing is that imagine, so you're a faculty member and someone hands you a book and says, here you go, make copies of this if you want, it's free, go ahead and do that. Would any of you have concerns about that as faculty? Making copies of academic work could be a career changer. For the, for the for the negative and and I've had actually say no I don't I don't want to I you know I make my living on in the, in the academia and any kind of risk I take like am I breaking copyright is the question am I breaking copyright how do I know how do I know what the intent of this funder is if they went to the publisher and the publisher and said I'll fund this only if it's free forever how do they know that they have no documentation of it. And so they feel like they have to do exactly like they would do normally, like go to the publisher and say, do I have the right, can I have the right to do So there's this barrier of understanding of what these things are, these textbooks. But there's an easy solution to it. And that easy solution, so well, here's the problem. Copyright. Copyright is an incredible tool that we all build our academic and intellectual property rights on wonderful tool that we have. But in this case, because it's meant to protect you, your copies of things, in this case, when it's, the intent is actually to share things, it actually gets in the way. Right? It's a great tool, but in this situation, it has some problems. So this is where the Creative Commons comes in. Creative Commons was created by Larry Lessig and a few others, if you know Larry, he's running for president now, I think. And uh, it's a nonprofit organization. Um, and it's uh, intended to, what it, what it does is one thing, it makes licenses. It makes licenses for people who want to share things, your intellectual property. So instead of copyrights, all rights reserved, all rights reserved, which are you see hearing, it's, well, some rights are reserved. You still, if, you, if, if I write a book, I'm a copyright holder, if I put a Creative Commons license, so they made all these licenses, which we'll talk about in a minute, if I put it on the book, I'm still the copyright holder. I'm just licensing it. And so if you see that little CC on the book, or whatever it is they make, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a publication, maybe it's a whatever it is, 
I can license it this way, and it will tell you up front what you can do with it. It'll tell you that my intent is to share, so you don't have to worry about it. So that's that's what this symbol is. If you see the symbol, it's not closed captioning. I think that's in a square, maybe. Closed, this is Creative Commons, uh, Creative Commons license. And so it's kind of the missing piece on this model. If you make something that you intend to share, make sure everyone knows it. License it that way. Plus, there's some extra added benefits of these open licenses. You can also do these things. Different licenses will allow you to do combinations of these things. You can copy it for free. You can share it with your students or whoever you want to share it with. You can edit it. You can mix it with other things. Like if you find another resource and you want to stick that in the, in the textbook, you can keep it. You can use it. You have all these rights. You're not. There's no digital rights management that's going to like make it self-destruct in six months. So on. You can use it for what you need to use it for. These licenses, allow, so it not only makes them the books free, but it allows you to customize the books for whatever your students you think your students need. Make sure it fits the content of your course. So here's here's the license. I'll go over these really fast. This is rather technical, but the Creative Commons makes it super easy. All you, all you have to understand is what these four symbols mean, and you'll understand every Creative Commons license you ever see. Number one, way over there, is the buy license. That means, if you see that symbol, that means you can do all of these things, just attribute buy, attribute whoever made it. That's the most basic license. NC means non-commercial, so you can do all of these things, but if you want to make money at it, you still need to come back and talk to me as the copyright holder. Share alike means um, you can do all these things, but whatever it is, uh, whatever you make out of it, if you mix it with other things or edit it, whatever this new thing is, you need to use the exact same license that I use, share alike. And your last one is kind of not really an open license. It means no derivatives. It means you can't do all these things. You can't make, you can't mix it and you can't edit it. You can still share it, copy it, all that stuff, but you, but you better leave this exactly how I made it. No changing it at all. So that's it. If you if you understand all these, you'll understand the Creative Commons licenses. There's only six of them, and they have combinations of those symbols. Who wants to interpret this one? What does it mean? You can you can use this. You can share and mix whatever you want. And just attribute it to the person, and it's non-commercial. Right. And so it just so you can do all of those things. Attribute the author, attribute the copyright holder. And it's not that you can't do commercial things with it, it's that it's the same thing we're used to. Like if you want to do something commercial with it, come and talk to me, we'll work something out. My intent is when I put it out in the world is to share it, but not for commercial purposes. That's important to some people. Those are the licenses. And actually those licenses exist all over the internet and, and sometimes we don't even know it. The internet kind of runs on these licenses because there's a lot of people sharing a lot of things out there. So MIT OpenCourseWare, if anyone's familiar with that, the MIT OpenCourseWare on the bottom of every of those web, web pages of, it's just web pages full of course content, videos, syllabi, whatever. You'll see the license. Because the last thing MIT wants is you calling them saying, can I use this in my course? They want to tell you up front, use this in your course. Don't call us. <laughs> TED Talks. We're all familiar with TED Talks. And if you catch the very end of any of these videos, you'll see the same kinds of symbols here. This is buy. This is non-commercial. This is no derivatives. So they don't want you to cut their video up or lay voice over it or change it in any way. I don't know why they don't want you to do that, but it's their choice. And you know, because you see these symbols, you know how you can use it. I don't think attribution is going to be a big problem. <laughs> So anyway, those Creative Commons licenses are, are, are really everywhere. We kind of don't ignore them because the internet just kind of allows us to just access stuff we don't even think about. But that's what a Creative Commons license is. And so an open textbook is a textbook that is licensed this way. Okay, That's what an open textbook is. It isn't an electronic textbook. There's all sorts of commercial textbooks that are electronic and they cost a lot of money and they have DRM on them. And they have, that's not an open textbook. That's a digital or electronic textbook. 
An open textbook is one that is licensed to be free, and you can do all those things, depending on whatever the license is, right? So here's some quick examples. Um, SUNY. Right, State University of New York has created a whole bunch of open textbooks. They, I think they're up to maybe five or six right now. They've been doing this for years. Their libraries there have been doing this. Um, Portland State, they have created several as well. They are uh, moving really fast and creating them very quickly. Here's the call for proposals from Oregon State, basically offering faculty offering them. I thought there was a number in here. Fifteen, twenty thousand dollars as compensation, which is more than most textbook authors make. Um, unless you're the number one textbook author, you're having a ton of money. Yeah, that's my question. I mean, twelve percent rather low as compared to the person that's creating all the original content. Yeah. So, yeah. How much yeah. does the fact that someone made from the way the textbook? There may be much more knowledgeable people in the room about that. I only know one person in my college who writes a textbook. He is the number one textbook in his field, social work, a certain specific counseling. He makes a lot of money. If you are like, if you're making the, the um, I remember the big calculus book. There is a, there is like um, the calculus book. He makes millions and millions, but. The vast majority of faculty write books make almost nothing. Really, 12%, you think, yeah, you know, I don't do the math, I guess. What's that? $12 on a $100 textbook? What's that? Uh, I don't know. You're hundreds before you get to $1,000, right? I mean, hundreds of textbooks have to be sold. So, anyway, so it isn't a lot. Um, and some faculty actually, what I'm finding, really want to do this, even if it isn't going to make them as much, and they, they may or may not, I don't know, but I had a faculty member approach us this morning who said, I don't see an open textbook in my field, uh, how do I write one? I mean, you know, I mean, she wasn't necessarily looking for money, but at the same time, no one would ask her to write textbook, you know, not in concert. Right now, there's not a great avenue for that to go to really easily do that, but there are a lot of willing faculty who would prefer to kind of contribute to the field. I think they recognize that if, if you write an open textbook, your name will be out there, more than if you probably publish one of the publisher. That's what open access research folks know. If you want your research read, publish it openly. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, Rice University is funded very well by the Hewlett Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the Maximilian Foundation, millions and millions of dollars. And their goal is to create the 25 top enrolled books for the 25 top enrolled courses in the country. And they're at 15. Uh, and so they're getting there. And they're getting some, some serious adoptions and they're, they're, they're cutting into uh, the market share pretty well. Some of these cost upwards, I know the editor in chief told me some of these cost upwards of a million dollars to create. They're creating a lot of ancillary materials, a lot of instructor materials, quiz banks, so on, all of those things, besides the books. I think this physics book is like double digit. Uh, it's a two semester non, non calculus based physics book that has like double digit um, market share across the country. So uh, here it is. Uh, like 1,300 pages. Because it's open, it's really, you can get it in all sorts of formats. You don't have the concern of like locking it down so no one can get at it or copy it. So you can get it in a PDF, an EPUB, which is what like iBooks will read and so on. You can get it in print for, how much did we, this one cost? 33? 13.95 if you buy it individually on their website. Right, okay. Right, so about $34. It tends to be less than 20% of what a similar book would cost from a publisher. So. So you can get a print version of it. You can read it on the web if you want to. And again, because the content is accessible, or because it's open, because it's just out there and no one's worried about it being stolen, um, they have all of their books in Bookshare, which is a service that creates accessible versions, Braille versions, versions that are primed for screen readers and so on. We have responsibility. You have an office here, I'm sure, at Colorado State that's all about making content accessible. 
would make their job a lot easier. There are also these ancillary materials, PowerPoint slides, and instructor uh, manuals, so on. So, do most of the OpenStack books have solution manuals? And yeah, slides too? yeah, they do. And and you have to actually con contact them and prove that you're an instructor, and then they'll send them to you for nothing. Yes. They are very well, very well funded yeah. and very nice and stuff. Very, very good stuff. Um, here's the Cali books. These are the uh, law school consortium books. And not only do they have 25 to 30 books, but they update them every single year. You can see this is the 25, 15 version and so on. Because the law changes every year. They have to. Right? What percentage of books is that in terms of the total for a uh, law degree? Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a really good question. I'll have to check with our law school in Minnesota. So, so they're out there. And one of the problems we ran into really early on was the fact that no one, I mean, they're, they're kind of popping up all over. So where do you find these? I mean, if you're going to find a publisher textbook, you know, um, you know where to find. You can go to Pearson. You can go to McGraw Hill. Go look on their site, whatever. In fact, probably you'll be contacted by somebody anyway before you can go look, right? So one early thing that we realized was that it's really hard to find these things. And because they're, they're, they're being funded and created in a lot of different places. So about three and a half years ago, we did create a resource that I want to make sure you're aware of. And, and this is the Open Textbook Library. This is it's at open.umn.edu. And it's every textbook, openly licensed textbook that we could find. And now we're at about almost 200 of them in this library. Um, the books in this library are all openly licensed. They're all full textbooks. They're all downloadable in some way. So they're not, it isn't just a website. And there are a lot of reasons for that that I won't get into, but they're downloadable in some way. So the students can have them regardless of their connectivity and so on. Um, and the last one, we've changed a little bit, but I can't, I, when we put this together, the big question was quality. If it's free, how can it be any good? That's, it's kind of human nature to kind of think that. Like, you know, I showed you how, I think, through that business model. It could be published exactly the same way, just funded differently. But, it, but it's human nature to ask that question. So we started, um, so, but I'm not qualified to judge the 200 books. My PhD is in education. You can see there's lots of things here that have nothing to do with education. So the one kind of measure of quality so to, to go in was that it was adopted by somebody outside the author's institution. In other words, it was good enough for somebody else. If there was evidence of that, we put it in there. We've expanded that a little bit to say if it's like made by a consortium or by an institution that knows you know, how to do publishing, we'll just we'll take that. You know, so that if there's some sort of peer review involved. Okay, good. So, so um, this all sounds like so wonderful, doesn't it? And, and when I started this, I, you know, this is kind of the saying that kept me going in a way. It's like people kept telling me this is never going to happen. Publishers have all these, have all these uh, salespeople, and they are, you know, they're entrenched, and there's just no way you're going to get them out. And I'll have to tell you that, I mean, I love this quote. I went to the Kennedy Center, and it's carved into the wall. This is his inauguration speech where he basically laid out all of these things, this broad space and world peace, and, and said, we might never get this done, but let's begin doing it. And so to me, this feels like that this is what kept me going for a long time. Like, all right, we're just going to see what can happen. But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop here because it's been for almost four years. So much has happened. And it may sound like this kind of like dream but I want to show you that there's evidence that this is actually happening, that this is catching on, and that this is not wishful thinking. This is traffic in the Open Textbook Library since I opened it in early 2012. The traffic we got in the first year, we now cover in about three weeks, as far as like faculty coming and looking for books. We are, we've been asking faculty when we run workshops for faculty, we ask them to write reviews of the textbooks. These are the reviews that we got. Again, when I put them in the library, no idea how good they were. Just I knew they were open. That's all I knew. This is what they're saying about them. I 
I started working with faculty at Minnesota, and they've stuck with it. We started working with, I started working with uh, about a dozen that's now gone up to about 20 in the last year, year and a half. They potentially save their students almost a half million dollars. This is a small group of faculty who don't teach any large enrollment courses, who have average class sizes of 30 or 40. They replace their textbook and it just adds up so quickly. So they are really excited that they're having this impact on their students. I never imagined, I mean, three years ago that I maybe I didn't do the math, but how quickly this would add up. It's really um, happening fast. Let me give you another example that's very community college oriented, but really important. And this is what this idea of the Z degree, and this is a really hot topic in community colleges right now. Community colleges, like Tidewater is, the, is uh, in Virginia, and um, what they decided to do is they got their, all their faculty in their business uh, business administration associates degree decided they were going to replace everything with open content. The whole degree, so students for the whole degree, the Z stands for zero textbook costs. The whole degree they pay nothing, and 21 courses, a lot of work. Their their leadership supported them and helped them through this, and this is what happened. They did research on it. They found a statistically significant drop in, in drop in withdrawal rates. They saw a significantly different increase in C or better grades. The cost, obviously, the cost actually dropped about 25%. It's community colleges, the costs are less. So that's that amount of money means a lot. It's a huge percentage for the community college students. And this is kind of what they're attributing it to, a lot of it. I mean, it's a textbook. Textbooks. You know, it's still a textbook. There's nothing magical about it, except all their students had access to it on the very first day of class. Everyone bought it. No one waved. Nobody stole it. No one pirated it. Nobody, right? Everyone just had it. Equal access for every single student, no matter what their background or financial abilities. That's pretty amazing, I think. Um, how much time do I have? I don't. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to tell you a few other really quick stories that not only about the affordability piece of it, but about um, uh, about the impact of the openness of it. Because the affordability is huge, and it's a huge problem. But um, actually, you know what? I'm going to kind of skip. Well, really quickly, the very first faculty member who adopted one was a statistics faculty member in my college, and he used it for a year, and then came to me and said, you know, it's not quite right. I teach, she teaches a very, very basic statistics. She teaches using Excel, and she, and she wanted to integrate, put some things about Excel, some problem sets, some kind of how-tos, some whatever, with, into the book itself, aligned with the textbook content. And so I hired a work study student to help her. And I, over the summer, she basically rewrote every, I mean, she didn't rewrite the chapters, but she added what she wanted into every chapter. She also wrote like a thousand multiple choice questions. So I don't know what got into her, but, and added them to the book. And she has been using it ever since. And all of her colleagues started using it. There were three other faculty who've been, who started using them as well. And she is thrilled with it because it meets the exact needs of her students that she wants them to learn. She also sent it back to the author, by the way, the original author, who I happen to know and is thrilled. Every time she sees me, she's like, oh, Minnesota, like, hey, she contributed. She made it better. Maybe not the Excel pieces of it, whatever, but she did different pieces of it that added to it. Um, uh, this quick example, there's a math faculty at the University of Minnesota who, who made a bunch of uh, videos of himself doing problems. Just did it on his laptop with the camera on there, really low tech that kind of anybody could do, put them on YouTube. And then in the open textbook, he added in, really simple, just saying, hey, having problems with this, these problems? Look here, I'll show you how to do them. Links to those videos. Wow, that's amazing, I think. Simple, 
but it actually could be really impactful. That like when students need help, they can get it right there. Right? Um, and this is an example. It's kind of an interesting one I thought, which was there's some uh, four faculty or three faculty who typed up taught a personal finance class use an open textbook, and they came to me last December. And they called a meeting with me and they sheepishly said, we don't think we can use this open textbook anymore. So, okay, well, thanks for letting me know. I mean, can I ask you why? And she said, they said, they said, well, it has the consumer price index data is from 2010. That's in here in this chapter, it's getting kind of old. And you can imagine what my answer was, which is, you know, you can change that. You can edit that, right? And I told them that, I just what I said. And they said, yeah, we don't have time, we're busy. And I absolutely respect that. We're all super busy, faculty especially. So, and I said, okay, well, thanks for letting me know. And on the way out of the room, one of them said, kind of went, hmm, you know, the Consumer Price Index is public information, which it is. You just go to the website and look at consumer. Some of my earlier graphs are based on Consumer Price Index information. You can do that. And they sat there and brainstormed, actually, as I was, again, I was on my way out the door, and they said, why don't we just take that whole chapter out and have students do like a primary research project on the consumer price index data. And they agreed, they decided that's what they're gonna do. Now, they could have done that on a publisher, with a publisher's textbook for sure. I mean, that, right, I mean, it, it's independent of a book. They're going out there into the, C, the CPI side and they're gonna do this. But what I'm finding is that more and more, the faculty who were early, who adopted three and a half years ago, have now all started thinking about what can they do different? It's very, I find it very empowering to faculty. Like, they realize they can make changes themselves. To the book if it's not quite right. They don't have to throw it out, they don't have to look for a new one, they, don't have, they can just make it right. My job is to support them in that and give them the resources and help they need to make those adjustments. But anyway, that's another story. Um, one other thing that we now know is that we, there is some research now about open textbooks and the efficacy of them and the perceptions and the quality of the textbooks, besides my own data that I showed you earlier. So there's a research group at Brigham, Brigham Young University that they are the, the, the big researchers on open education. Um, when it comes to, to um, student outcomes, they did a meta uh, a study. They looked at all the studies that, that studied student outcomes and compared open to non-open content. There were 11, it's not a lot, but it's what was there. It included 48,000 students. And what they found were that 93% of the time, 93% of the outcomes of the time, they, they were the same or better outcome with open. 93% of the time. Any idea how much was same and how much was better? Um, this, is, this is the text they sent me which I'm trying to figure out how this fits into this. This is a brand, they just sent me this. They said, hey, you might want to be able to, they said, none showed results in which students who utilized OER performed worse than their peers who used traditional. No, this is actual outcomes, measures of outcomes. So I'm not really sure, 93% to me doesn't, okay. anyway. They also did perceptions of quality, and they asked students and they asked faculty about the perceptions of quality of open textbooks compared to the commercial textbooks. Because that is a big question, right? As we talked about earlier. 4,500 about evenly split students and faculty. And this is what they found. So I don't know exactly enough to, to know exactly how to, I, I can't explain that. It seems to me there's both textbooks. I don't know why one first, except one is free. So might that have been ranked a little higher? I don't know. So, but those are the studies. These are all, again, this is a meta study of nine different peer reviewed journals. So, how it was measured I, I, it may vary. But that's what they came up with. So, that I think was our hope early on was that we would find that these things are worth something, that they are quality enough that we may be worth considering. So, what I'm trying to say to you is this isn't, a, this isn't um, just a dream anymore. It's happening. It's becoming more mainstream. There's now evidence to show that, that um, you're, you aren't necessarily, you have to be the judge of that as faculty, but you're not necessarily, giving, you're not giving up quality. You can have the same student outcomes or better. I think what we're arguing is better. It's going to be better because they're going to have equal access from day one. Right. And 
we have institutions who are starting open education, open textbook programs. This is a list of, of universities and systems that are now working with us, University of Minnesota, and that we're trying to, to um, pull together as a community to try to support each other. Representatives from most of these institutions came to Minnesota this summer, and um, we talked about how to move forward together. So it's becoming a mainstream thing at institutions as well, something that I think the administration feels like it's important to support. If a faculty member wants to choose open, that there ought to be some support mechanism there and, and, and some expertise on the campus to, to be able to talk about these things. This is, there are, uh, I think we're at about 23 schools and systems. Some of them are statewide systems, like all of Minnesota statewide systems, North Dakota community colleges are in. So it adds up to actually like 80 some campuses nationally and growing very quickly. That's what the open, we're calling the Open Textbook Network. And, uh, and uh, getting a lot of traction on that and interest. So it's very exciting. So what can we do as faculty? It's pretty simple, actually. It's just take a look. That's all anybody has ever asked me about that from a so faculty. Go to that website. I have the URL in. If you're a faculty member and you're interested in just taking a look, please do. If it makes sense for you and your students, again, and you're the only one who can judge that. If it makes sense for you to do, then consider adopting it. And adopting it is as easy as downloading it. Like if you go to the Open Textbook Library, I'm, it doesn't ask you to log in, doesn't ask you. You can just go click on a book and download it, and it's on your desktop in you know 10 seconds. And you can take a look at it. You can email it to your student. You can send a link, put it in your course management system to your student saying, this is the textbook, what do you think? It's, it's that easy. So, and here's the other thing that I'm finding, it makes a big difference. Just telling your peers, telling your colleagues that these things exist so that they can maybe take a look and consider it. That how important, that's incredibly important. At Purdue, when I was, we were at Purdue running a workshop and a, and a young woman was there who taught some introductory math courses. And she decided she was gonna switch what she did to open. And she went back and talked to, well, not only her husband who taught in a different department who switched open, but she went back and talked to her department and her program area who taught all those. They now have flipped all of their undergraduate or their lower division math courses. And this is at Purdue. They're talking 4,000 students a semester who take those courses and a few thousand in the summer. And their textbook costs 200 bucks, is my understanding. It used to. So do the math, 4,000, 4,000, 2,000, that's 10,000. At $200 a piece, that's $2 million a year they're saving students. And it's all because she went back, had the discussion, just said, hey, guess I was just at this workshop, guess what? These things exist. You wanna look at them? Let's look, you know, consider it. See if it works. So think about that. Finally, I'm done. Whoops. So here's a URL to the library. If you're interested in that at all, um, again, it's just open. There's no login. There's no nothing on it at all. Um, I get criticized sometimes for that. So like, you should track exactly what everyone's doing. No, this is about being open. You should be able to just access this and download it without anybody caring your decision. So you're welcome to that. If you have questions, I well, we have time for questions, don't we? So we can do that, um, and I my contact information is also there. So afterwards, if you don't want to be up here, do that. Yes. Yeah. So the question was, or the question, the question was, what kind of pushback are we getting from bookstores? I would say it it, it, it varies widely. So. At my campus, I didn't tell our bookstore director for a while. <laughs> and uh, I was a little sheepish about it because I, it seems like, like they're the only losers in this, kind of, right? I mean, it seemed like it. And I finally held a meeting with him um, and said, this is what we're doing. And he, his response was, um, he said, well, it's about time somebody did this. I, I expected that, you know, I, this should have happened years ago. And after the meeting, I kind of like cornered him and said, Bob, tell me, like, what, why are, like, I'm a little confused. I thought you might not like this. He said, and I, and I quote this everywhere because I have an incredible respect for this gentleman. He said, you know, we're self-sustaining. 
And if we start losing money, then I'll go talk to the president and we'll talk about it, we'll figure it out. But if I stop meeting the needs of students and faculty, I'll be done long before then. And so what he basically was saying that is that he understands as book store director what his, what, how he fits into the mission of the university. His mission is to meet the needs of students and faculty. And they have been, he would go to meetings with vice provosts with me and things, and he would sit there as the definitive authority on textbook prices. He would say, you know, this is how many textbooks now cost over $200. This publisher raised all their textbook prices by 17% last year, and so on. So there's a great ally to have. Um, I've been at schools where I was invited by the vice president of auxiliary services, you know, which includes the bookstore, and they know the bookstores are changing anyway. And actually, this is a minor concern compared to, say, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. It's a concern still, but they're more, um, some, so some of them are seeing it as strategic, like this is something we should just do, even the bookstores are. Um, that said, um, there definitely is, uh, there are some bookstores and bookstore systems that benefit students through sales. I mean, so uh, the California State University system, right, the right system, um, they, uh, a certain percentage of sales and profits goes to a, a, a scholarship fund. So that's the leverage they're kind of saying, well, if you manage profits of this bookstore, then there won't be as many scholarship funds. Um, they also won't need to use their scholarships to buy books. But anyway, that aside, so there are times like that that it's kind of it's kind of touchy. But basically, the way I will answer that is, yeah, you need to have a discussion internally about priorities and where you decide what you decide. And that, that makes sense. So could it hurt bookstores? Yeah, if it really, if it does go the direction it's going, it, it could. But bookstores are being changing anyway. I mean, they really are. Good question. So we've got two students in the audience. Can you tell us what you major in, and are there any open textbooks used in any of your courses, or have the professors talked about that at all, guys? Um, hi, my name is Philippe. I'm a psychology major. Um, all right. Okay. Hi, my name is Philippe, and I'm a psychology major. And I've actually had some. I had a variety of experiences. I've bought a three hundred dollar textbook before. I've also used open source textbooks in statistics. I have had a professor in logic and critical thinking who published his own using King codes and sold it for twenty bucks, which I found to be very deeply appreciated. And because it was his own, he had exercises. He just made his own textbook because he had so many handouts. And overall, I, I fully agree with everything. I mean, I've been in a situation where I had to uh, share a textbook with four people, and wow. that was ridiculous, to say the least. We just ended up forming study groups and just doing it all together. So you read a chapter, you read a chapter, you read a chapter, let's do this together to save costs. And every single thing that I saw in this presentation, I mean, I thought I'd have to bring it up to you, but you kind of already hit it on the head, so. I'm very impressed. Thank you. You don't have to. So uh, I'm Jake. I'm a business major, and we've never really gone over the open source textbooks. I probably, especially I've got a little business class. I probably average about six to seven hundred dollars a semester. Quite a few business uh, open textbooks. So, <laughs> right that right that URL down. <laughs> so, can you talk a little bit about the um, what you and Sarah are going to be doing tomorrow? Oh yeah, you know, that'll be informative. Yeah, I don't quite know yet. Um, so, what we'll be doing is meeting with a group of about 50 faculty, which is by far the largest group we've ever. Uh, we're really excited about the excitement here on campus. So. Um, so about 50 faculty um, will come in and we'll go over much of what we talked about here today. So it's a basically uh, helping them understand the financial situation that students are in, the impact that textbooks have on them, and then the impact that those textbook costs have on students' academic success, potential academic success, which faculty really, really care about. It, 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 that's why we don't. That's why I don't. I don't stop at just talking about money. It's not about money. It's not about textbooks. It's about academic success. 
And so then we'll, we'll kind of tell them a little bit about what open is, the licenses. We might go into that a little bit uh, deeper because if they're going to adapt some of these books, they should know what the licenses say. Um, and then um, we will uh, send them off and give them about a month and a half to write a review of one of these textbooks. And they are uh, they will be compensated for that uh, by Colorado State University, a couple hundred dollars, $250 to write a review. That review will end up here on this. We have over 200 reviews in this open textbook library right now. We'll add another 50, apparently, in the next uh, few weeks. And um, what we find is that um, paying faculty to write just $250 is not a lot of money. I mean, it's the cost of one textbook, right? It, it's not a lot of money, but it's enough. Faculty are so busy doing such important work that to just bump it up their priority list just a little bit. That to say we value your time, would you just take a look at this for the benefit of your students? But that really works pretty well. And, it, and if students, if they just if they write a review, oftentimes they kind of will start looking at it and go, oh, this might be possible. And that's what we're finding is that, that that's um, something that I think the faculty appreciate the process because their time is valued and they're educated about the issues and um, it, it might lead to them making the decision. That's what we'll be doing tomorrow. I'm excited about that. Other questions, Tom? Yes, sir. Um, I represent uh, Associated Students of Colorado State University. We're kind of the student government. How can I personally help to kind of spread this information? How can I, what can I do from the student's perspective, if you will? Um, good question. And, and um, introduce a set, Bill. I'm on that already. Good. Okay, so, that, so there's a number of things that student groups have done around the country, and policy is one of them, and, and, and approaching faculty senate, and um, that happened at Minnesota, that's happened in many places. I get contacted by student governments all the time, and they say, what can we do? Um, you have a lot of support already, you know, in the, in the libraries here. Um, they are moving. This, this is happening here. But policy and awareness are the two biggest things that you can help with. If, like a Senate bill, something like that. I know that in Minnesota, our students are really excited. They, they uh, one semester, organized students to go out and talk to each of their, like they each talked to one of their faculty members. They're all of their faculty members. And they had a whole bunch of students. You can cover a lot of faculty pretty quickly. And all they did was respectfully said, we want to make you aware that this exists. And would you please take a look at it and just think about it. Well, I'll also add that um, I'm tweeting him right now. Uh, the higher ed perks have a toolkit, yeah. and that's to help student governments raise this issue on their campuses. And it sounds like you've already gotten great advice and that you have support here. But they have a yeah. toolkit that you can use that has content that has been tried and true at campuses across the country. So I'm tweeting them right now for you, and hopefully. That's great. Their website or they'll reach out to you. I don't know if you guys are members of the US PERG, but this for the public interest research group. Uh, it's a you know advocacy group of students really nationally. The big voices in this and they have a lot of great that's a very, very good suggestion. One more thing. If you look at where publishers are going and also with course load, the thinking is shifting more to interaction with the students rather than just giving them the content in the textbook. Where do you see that going? How does that stir into? So I'll repeat the question just for the mic here. But the question is that textbook companies are increasingly getting involved, and others are getting involved in um, services around the content that may be individualized learning kinds of, that's a hot topic right now, or um, you know, um, personalized learning, I think, actually, is the phrase that's used most often. Or um, you know, there's question banks. There's things that services around the content, that, and that's actually where publishers are going really fast. They're moving in that direction because, in some ways, they know the battle's lost for content. They can't compete with free. The services and convenience. I mean, it's great. I mean, that's what we want. We want this. If, we're, if, if this is helping drive some innovation in publishers, that's really that's really nice. 
By the way, some of these open, like OpenStax, the Rice University, they are also doing the same stuff. They are doing ancillary materials and services around it with their open content. Um, so I am all for it. I, I, I think it's a good thing that in some ways the publishers are being forced to innovate and add value to their products. They're also adding a lot of cost potentially, but that's a whole other matter. Um, you know, I'm not a textbook advocate. Like, it's not like textbooks aren't the end of learning. They're a piece of that, that some use for teaching and learning, um, but they just happen to be a pain point. That's why we're focusing on that right now. So, so I'm all for more active learning and innovation with publishers. Very, very good question. Anything else? We let you go. Thank okay, you thank you. Thank you.